standards of professional practice or, or practice standards for short. Uh, they are the minimum acceptable principles, practices, and conduct expected of a notary public that are widely recognized as effective in ensuring the integrity, reliability, and security of notarial acts. Now that definition highlights two key points that standards of practice want to accomplish. The first is to provide rules for expected notary conduct. In other words, standards of pro uh, conduct teach you how to behave when you perform a notarial act. The second thing the standards do and want to accomplish is to make notarizations more trustworthy. What it shows are two circles. The blue circle stands for the entirety, the totality of all the notary standards of practice that are out there, okay? The mauve colored circle stands for the law. Now, when you look at this diagram and you look at the way it interacts with, with each other, with, with the two circles, there are four points we learn that clarify uh, a standard versus keeping the law. Okay, here's the first point. A standard of practice may be in the law. Now you can see that by the overlap between the mauve and the, the blue colored circles, okay? So in Maryland law, I'll give you a couple examples of standards of professional practice for notaries that are in your statute. For example, it is a standard of notary practice for a notary to record an entry in a, in a journal for all notarial acts. And that also is in the annotated code of, of, of Maryland. And it's also in the DC code too. Another example, there's a standard of notary practice that says, if you keep a tangible paper journal, it's gotta be permanently bound with numbered pages. That's also in the code of Maryland. And it's also in the DC code, if I remember correctly. And then there's another one. Uh, another standard of practice for notaries is that you need to keep your journals for at least 10 years after the last recorded entry in your journal. And guess what? There's a statute in the code of Maryland about that. So you can see there's overlap between standards of practice and uh, the law, and that's what we should expect. But here's the second point. Every state has some, but not all standards of practice in its law. You can see from the diagram that there are standards that are outside of notary law. It's just not possible for the law to contain all the standards. Uh, they can't possibly address in a timely manner everything that comes up, although they try to add them later and amend things later when things do come up. So let me give you a couple of examples of standards of notary practice that are not in the law. There is a standard of notary practice that says that notaries should not notarize a document containing blank spaces. And the reason is, if you notarize that blank as is, somebody could put something in there that wasn't supposed to be there after it's notarized. You know, it's supposed to help prevent fraud, okay? Now, from my reading of Maryland law and the district law, I don't think it's in there. It's outside of it, but it's still a standard of practice that notaries should adhere to. A second example, there's a notary standard of practice that says, that uh, if you are notarizing for a signer who doesn't speak your language, you shouldn't use an interpreter or a translator, but you should send them to a bilingual notary. Now, the reason for that is, as a notary, you have to understand the signer because you're gonna be making certifications about the notarial act that have to be truthful. And in order to do that, you have to be able to understand what the signer is saying. That too is also a standard, but it's not in the law. 
It's outside the law, okay? That brings up the third point. A standard of practice doesn't have to be in the law for you to follow it. You know, we would really encourage you to only notarize documents that are complete. We would encourage you to use a bilingual notary instead of notarizing a document with an interpreter for someone who you can't understand. Now, here's the fourth point. This one's going to surprise you. Take a look at the lower part of the law mauve colored diagram. Notice that there is a section there that's outside of the standards. Okay, here's the, here's the principle. A law may not be a standard of practice or may conflict with one. Every state has some, but not all standards. You know, if you are to follow standards of practice, even though they're not in the law, where do you go to find these standards? And the answer is the Notary Public Code of Professional Responsibility. This is the single best source for most, I won't say all, not all because not all standards are in here, but certainly the most important standards of practice that you can follow as a notary. And this, my friends, is your field guide. This is your field guide for performing both traditional and technology-based notarial acts. A standard of practice achieves two goals. It seeks to, number one, provide rules of conduct for notaries. And two, it, it seeks to make notarizations more secure. All right. What I want to do is I want to take a standard out of the code for each of that. One that speaks to your conduct and one that speaks to making notarizations more secure. Okay. So the first one is from guiding principle two. Now, guiding principle two, that's the second command, right? All right. Um, here's what it says. The notary shall act as an impartial witness and not profit or gain, nor attempt to profit or gain from a notarial act apart from the fee for the act and any charge associated with the fee, if applicable. Okay? Now, that guiding principle teaches us that a notary must be an impartial witness, okay? Profiting or gaining or attempting to profit or gain apart from the fees you can charge and any associated fee, like Michael Schlein was talk, uh, talking about travel fees. That's an associated fee that you can charge uh, or perhaps a technology fee for remote notarization would be an associated fee. That's okay. But anything beyond that, not okay. So the best way I can kind of illustrate this is, 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 is think about a judge, okay? A judge, you've heard the, the expression justice is blind, right? That's a way of saying that judges have to be impartial. They can't side with any one party of a lawsuit. So let's say there's a judge and the judge has bought stock in Apple. And there's a case involving Apple that comes up before his court and he's asked to preside over it, all right? Now, as a stockholder in Apple, he would have a conflict of interest, right? He would be on Apple's side because he's bought stock in the company. And this is why in those cases, judges will recuse themselves and have another judge step in to, to take the case, all right? You gotta be impartial. You cannot be perceived as a notary of, as being partial or unfair to anyone. You can't be on any side of the, any party of this transaction. You gotta be completely objective and impartial. All right, so now within guiding principle two, there is the following standard. And I'm going to tell you before I show it, this is controversial, but I wanted to bring it up because of that. All right. Because I want to make you think. Guiding principle 2A3 
gifts and gratuities. Let's read it. The standard says, the notary shall not accept any gift, gratuity, or donation relating to the performance of a notarial act from or on behalf of any past, present, or potential future customers. Why do you think we might say that a notary shouldn't accept tips? Because if, if that customer gives you a tip, it might impair your impartiality. It might tempt you away from following proper notarial procedure, especially if they're uh, a, a consistent customer. All right? Standard and the guiding principles say you can't profit apart from the fee and any charge associated with the fee. Now, in this standard, the code, we have an illustration. Let's take a look at the illustration, okay? Here's what it says. Again, we're trying to picture this for you so that you can place this in, you, you can place yourself in the picture. A principal or a document signer for whom the notary performs frequent notarizations sent $100 to the notary with a note enclosed stating that, quote, in appreciation for your notarial service, the $100 is for your favorite charity. The notary considers whether to send the donation to the local disaster relief fund. Well, you know, here, what's interesting is the notary is not directly profiting from that 100 bucks, right? The, the customer says, didn't give him a tip. Here's 100 bucks. It's been great. No, here's a donation for your charity. Is this something that also impairs the notary's impartiality? The resolution to the standard says that the notary, and if you're kind of looking this up in the book, you'll see, <laughs> the notary sends the donation back to the, to the customer. And I want to cite for you why. This is a snippet from the commentary in the back of that, okay? And this is how looking at the commentary can help you understand what's going on. Here's what the commentary says. The illustration was intentionally selected to emphasize the indirect benefit to the notary of a donation to the notary's favorite charity. The resolution directs the notary to refuse the gift this action is especially appropriate in contrast to a situation in which a check or property is tendered to the notary for the notary's direct personal use and benefit, a $100 tip. Even when the notary could not directly and personally use the money or property gifted, the notary would benefit from the goodwill resulting from such a charitable donation to a worthy cause and therein lies the actual or apparent conflict that is created. Oh, look how great of a notary I am. I got this donation, right? That impairs your impartiality. Now, let me say this. Neither the district nor Maryland say you can't accept a tip. The law says, if I read it correctly, the notary cannot have a direct beneficial interest in a transaction. This is an indirect benefit. You're not getting the 100 bucks. But remember how I said that sometimes standards, you can follow a standard even if it's not in the law? The law of Maryland and the law of the district certainly wouldn't prevent you from returning the gift or the donation, correct? It would be your call. All right, but make no mistake about it. Your objectivity of a, as a notary is so important that it's, it cannot be impaired. All right, second example. Now this, this that last one I shared because that kind of regulates your conduct as a notary, right? This one, reg, this one is meant to show how the notarial act makes a notarial act more trustworthy, okay? This is um, 
standard four, that's guiding principle four, D, article D, one, uh, which says this, a notary shall not waive any legal requirement of a notarial act because a person or entity directs or requests the notary to do so. Okay, now this standard uh, falls under guiding principle four, which says basically that a notary is prohibited from completing a false notarial certificate, a certificate the notary knows is false, or to participate in any transaction the notary believes is false, okay? Now, here's the illustration for this standard, okay? Let's take a look at it. The notary works for a mortgage servicer acting under the supervision of an attorney who submits motions for summary judgment pertaining to foreclosure actions in state court. The motions require the executives to sign and take an oral oath or affirmation in the presence of a notary. The attorney directs the notary to perform the notarizations on motions without the executives being formally sworn or affirmed, since the motions are only quote, boilerplate. Now, I, I, attorneys are wonderful people. We might, I know we have attorneys in the room. Sometimes uh, attorneys are misguided and they ask notaries to do um, improper things. This is actually an example taken from the last recession in 2008, where there was this big foreclosure crisis, remember? And you may have heard in the news about all these um, affidavits for foreclosure that were being notarized improperly without people being present, swearing oaths, and all kinds of manner of things. It hit the national news, all right? Now, here's the resolution for this particular illustration. The notary declines to follow the attorney's directive, and that takes guts, right? That takes guts. The notary may explain to the attorney that state law requires the actual administration of the oath or affirmation to the executives for each motion. Now, how does this make the notarization more trustworthy? Well, when you as an, and by the way, I hope all of you as notaries, when you perform a verification on oath or affirmation, notarization, are administering oral oaths or affirmations because you're required to. The notarial certificate says, subscribed and signed before me, all right? Subscribed, uh, or, is this, or subscribed and sworn before me, or subscribed and affirmed before me, you see? That indicates you administered an oath or affirmation. The reason the oath or affirmation is important is because we have to impress upon the per person being sworn the seriousness of what they're doing. Second reason is the oath or affirmation actually puts that individual under the, the penalties for false swearing or perjury if they lie. And that's important because the parties relying on that affidavit for foreclosure, okay? The borrower who's being foreclosed upon is one of them. They're relying that the individual swore the truth, all right? And finally, if the notary didn't administer the other affirmation, we found out in the foreclosure crisis that those notarizations were invalid, All right? So, I hope you will take the time to get to know your field guide. It's your compass for finding the true north in every situation you face as a notary, both for traditional notarial acts as well as technology-based ones.